we are asked to determine how we could use infrared spectroscopy to monitor the progress of this reaction. But before we can look at these answer boxes here, of course we have to make a prediction about what the product is going to look like here. Now, we learned in a previous chapter about the oxidation of alcohols. And specifically, if you look at this alcohol, what you want to do is decide if this is a primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohol. And to make that decision, look at the carbon that is directly bonded to the hydroxyl group, the OH group right here, and then ask yourself how many carbons are bonded directly to that carbon. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that that carbon is bonded to that carbon over here, and then of course it's bonded directly to this carbon over here. So that's a total of two carbons that are bonded directly to the carbon connected to the hydroxyl group. This makes it a secondary alcohol. And in that prior chapter, we learned that when we oxidize a secondary alcohol, we end up with a ketone. This is a reaction whose mechanism you probably don't have to know. It's one of those reactions in organic chemistry, frankly, that you're supposed to just memorize, although I don't like saying to do so. But for the purposes of this question, it's probably sufficient to just do it that way. And next, let's redraw the hydroxyl group in the form of OH, like this. You can put the lone pairs on there if you want to be fancy. And now we can start to look at some of the characteristic infrared absorptions that we would expect in each case. Now, in particular, we would have an OH bond right here. And a lot of textbooks give slightly different ranges for the infrared absorption of that bond. But generally speaking, you're looking for a signal around the range of maybe 32 to 3400. And then the unit there is inverse centimeters. That's probably the most significant infrared signal that we would find on this molecule. So let's look at the ketone, the product. And the most significant bond here would be the carbonyl bond. This is the bond between carbon and oxygen. It's a double bond. And again, textbooks may vary with what signal they would expect for that bond, but generally it's in the range of about 1710, maybe 1720. And this would be again inverse centimeters. And so those two bonds probably are going to be sufficient for us to examine to get this question correct. So let's take a look here. The first answer box says, look for the appearance of a peak at 1630. Well, we didn't say anything about peaks at 1630, so this answer box is going to be eliminated. Look for a disappearance of a peak at 1720. Now be careful about the wording here, of course. We do have a signal around 1720, but it's not a disappearance of that signal. It's actually an appearance of that signal because we go from a molecule that wouldn't have that signal to a molecule that does have that signal. So that would be an appearance, not a disappearance. The third answer box, look for an appearance of a very broad peak at 2,500 to 3,000. I don't think this molecule presented an appearance of any signal in that range, so we can eliminate that. Look for appearance of a peak at 1720. Aha, we finally have that. That's going to be correct because, again, we did have the carbonyl bond being formed, and that generated a signal around 1710, maybe 1720. The next answer box, look for appearance of a peak at 3500. Nope, we did not have a bond whose infrared signal would be at 3500 appear in the reaction. But then the final box says, look for a disappearance of that same peak of 3,500. Now, we claim that the bond would be anywhere from 3,200 to 3,400, but some books go all the way up to 3,600, especially if the molecule is in the gas phase. And so this seems reasonable that that signal would be a disappearance because going from reactant to product, we certainly have a loss of that signal. So the final answers would be an appearance of a peak at 1720 and then a disappearance of a peak at 3,500.